Read in Paul's epistle to the Ephesians in chapter 4. Ephesians in chapter 4. I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavouring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, and through all, and in you all. But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Now this, he ascended, what does it mean but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we should no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men in the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting, but speaking the truth in love may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love." This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart, who, being past feeling, have given themselves over to lewdness, to work all uncleanness with greediness. But you have not so learned Christ, if indeed you have heard him, and have been taught by him, as the truth is in Jesus, that you put off concerning your former conduct the old man which grows corrupt according to the deceitful lusts, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it might impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. And be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in, in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the, children, the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. Amen. May God bless his word to us tonight. <clears throat> 
Well, you'll turn with me tonight to the epistle of Paul to Titus in chapter 3. Titus chapter 3. We'll read the opening verses. Remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities, to obey, to be ready for every good work, to speak evil of no one, to be peaceable, gentle, showing all humility to all men. For we ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. But when the kindness and the love of God our Saviour toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us, through the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Spirit, whom he poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that having been justified by his grace, we should become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. This is a faithful saying, and these things I want you to affirm constantly, that those who have believed in God should be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable to men. Let's just ask God's blessing on his word. Our gracious God, as we gather together around your word, tonight we commit this time to you and ask that you draw near to us. We pray that this faithful saying that we'll hear tonight will become true for us and that it'll change our lives and send us from here rejoicing. Well, the great theme of this short passage is regeneration. And when we speak of regeneration, of course, we are speaking about the same matter about which the Lord Jesus spoke to Nicodemus when he told Nicodemus that he needed to be born again. Jesus told him that he needed to be born again or else he would never see the kingdom of God and he would never enter the kingdom of God. So clearly it's a very important matter, a matter of utmost importance and seriousness. Only those who have been born again, only people who are regenerated will see or enter the kingdom of heaven. Now you and I might not like or appreciate that truth, We might think that it's a little bit too narrow and too exclusive for our taste, but that is what the Bible tells us, and that's what the Lord Jesus tells us. And he tells us that because he loves us and because he wants us to know the new birth and to enter into God's kingdom, because the alternative to that is too terrible and too bleak to contemplate, because not to know the new birth is to be excluded from God's kingdom and to be exposed forever to God's wrath in hell. Now, if these things are true, which they are, we need to know what regeneration is and what it means. And so we're going to spend some time looking at these verses that we've just read tonight. And we'll take time because... It does take time and it takes effort to understand the Bible and to get to grips with God's truth. Ultimately, of course, we are utterly dependent upon the Holy Spirit to open up God's Word to us, to give us a true and a spiritual understanding of the Scriptures. But the Holy Spirit doesn't just drop the truth into our laps. We have to give ourselves to seeking God and to searching out the truth. The problem is that too many people today, it seems to me, are too unwilling for that. And even Christians uh, have become like that. They, They just want to sit back and have someone else do all the work for them to break everything down into bite sized pieces and to be spoon fed the truth. And if it's not just as they like it, well, then they're just not interested. Many are like that. Many are like self-conscious toddlers in a high chair. And if it's not what they want, well, they'll pay no attention. Now, if we're to know the truth, really know the truth, we have to dig the mine of truth ourselves. And that means dedication and devotion and discipline and effort to get to grips with what God's Word says to us. Now, verses 3 through 7 of this chapter are actually a single sentence. It was probably well known in the early church as a creedal statement, as an instructional statement which people would learn by heart. It wouldn't do you any harm to learn these, this sentence. 
in, in uh, yourself in verses 3 through 7. And I want eventually to get to the heart of the statement, which is in verse 5, where Paul talks about the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. That's the theme, regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit, what that means according to the Apostle Paul. But we're going to begin tonight with verse 3. And I want to start by showing you why you need to be regenerated, why you need to be born again. So the need for regeneration. Now, when you look at the context in which the verses are found, you find that all through this short pastoral epistle from Paul to Titus, Paul has got one particular thing in mind. He's very anxious that these members of these early churches should live out their Christian lives, not only within the local congregation in fellowship with other Christian believers, but but also and this is what chapter 3 is concerned about, that they should live out their lives in society, their Christian lives in society around them. He wanted them to live lives that commend the gospel of Jesus Christ and to silence opposition to the truth. So on Monday mornings and every other day, he wants them to demonstrate an entirely new way of living life, a new lifestyle. And that's what he's talking about in chapter 3. But the only source of power for that, for living this new life, is the new birth. They needed the new birth. They needed the power of regeneration. A real work of God in the human heart which gives such new power within that everybody sees it in the way in which we live our lives. An inner heart transformation that is evidenced by a changed life. Now, when Paul wrote this letter in the first century, this idea and this concept of regeneration, the word itself, was in very common use. Um, Today, politicians speak, don't they, about economic regeneration, as you know. A while ago, there were some politicians speaking about the need for a moral regeneration in our society. Well, in the first century, regeneration was a buzzword and learned men of the day discussed the concept and the idea of regeneration it was something upon which the ancient world hung its hopes and longings they were longing for a better world they were looking for the dawn of a new day and the creation of a new society and it seems to me that that is a desire in almost every generation and certainly in the the older teenagers of every generation, young people, students, can be highly idealistic and they ent- entertain high hopes that where their parents have failed them so miserably, they're going to succeed in changing, regenerating human society. That's true of almost every generation of older teenagers. They long for things to be better and they dream of being the ones who are going to bring it about. The writer to the book of Ecclesiastes, of, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes speaks in a similar way. Uh, through a popular revolt, the writer says, the people dis- uh, depose their old, foolish king, and he's replaced by a young, wise king who is very popular, and everybody praises him. But it doesn't last long, he says, and before very long, the people are complaining about the new king and criticizing him they thought it was all going to be so much better so different from the old days and before long they're looking for another new king always searching for better days always looking for a changed society always longing for a new world well in one sense those hopes are commendable but What we want to do tonight is to root those hopes in reality, to root them in the soil of the New Testament. Now, it seems to me that the writers of Scripture are anything but in the mold of students. They knew nothing of this idealistic confidence of a student. They had absolutely no trust whatever in human potential for self-improvement. There's nothing of that in the New Testament. Uh, And you can see that from this chapter, Titus 3. 
Just glancing at verses 4 and 5 and 6, you can see that Paul in this wonderful passage talks about and directs their attention to the work of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. As far as the Apostle Paul and the other New Testament apostles were concerned, the work of the whole blessed Trinity is necessary for just one person to be brought to newness of life and into God's kingdom. For the New Testament writers, salvation is purposed by God the Father, it is purchased by God the Son, it is proclaimed by God the Holy Spirit. And in perfect union, then, the Holy Trinity works together to save human beings. God has come to do this work, and without that, there is no possibility at all of any lasting fundamental change in the world and in our lives, the lives of individuals and the lives of society as a whole. Apart from God, every effort to change ourselves is doomed to failure. That's how the New Testament depicts the human race. But when you look around you today and you ask people about the possibility of making things better, of transforming society, almost to a man people think that that's possible. That it's possible for us to change our lot and to bring about a better world. And that's because we reject the Bible's diagnosis of the human condition. And that's the diagnosis that you find in verse 3. That we were foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. I suppose there's a sense in which we are very fortunate to be evangelical believers living in this day and generation rather than, say, 60 years ago. 60 years ago, most religious people were still full of an absurd optimism. And 70 years before that, things were even worse, where all the leading theologians and philosophers of the day were predicting the coming of an unprecedented age of peace and prosperity and the advancement of the human race on every front. They were looking for a utopia. They were expecting it to come. All that false hope, all the great expectations of those days, ended on the wastelands of Europe. Blighted hopes by war. The First World War, the devastated civilization, put an end to all that humanistic optimism. The shallow romantic hopes of two generations lay shattered amongst the corpses on Flanders fields. Humanism was dead, or you would have expected it to be. And it would have been, but for incurable pride, human pride, our utter determination to trust our own resources and to organize life without God. And so humanism survives today, in spite of the century that people have lived through. There is both religious and secular humanism. And the first article of the creed is, I believe in man. After a century that saw two world wars, Stalin's purges, the Cruelty and violence of Pol Pot, the Chinese genocide in Tibet, the Balkans, Rwanda, all these atrocities, so many atrocities that, you know, time forbids us to list them, and to do so would only fill us with despair and horror. After such a century, how amazing it is that we can still be living in a world where we think we can build a utopia and have a better world that man has got the ability to do it. How can people still possibly think that? It's astonishing, isn't it? But at least now it's beginning to dawn on people that we're not going to be able to change society without some kind of spiritual reality. People are a bit vague about what they mean when they talk in those terms of what it ought to be. But at least we're beginning to see that the evil in society is so deeply entrenched 
And we need more than just a change, even a radical change of outward circumstances. We also need an inner transformation, inner change. The pity is that people are not looking to Christ for that. They're still looking for themselves, and they still believe that it lies within their own grasp and resources, that they can sort out their own spiritual problems. And in that and every other case of self-regeneration, it's all bound up with failure. It fails every time, and the reason why it fails is because of this diagnosis in verse 3 that we will not accept. Well, listen to it again, because it's so characteristic of how the Bible describes the condition of unregenerate mankind. We ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Now, the typical modern man will immediately reject that. Sixty years ago, if you were studying in a theological college and listening to liberal theologians, liberal lecturers, you would hear hear them ridiculing a verse of Scripture like this and saying that it's far too pessimistic and uh, it's all down to Paul's morbidity. But since then, many, many people have come to realize that there is something, nonetheless, that is very deep-seated in our hearts, something that thwarts every dream of a better life that stops it coming to pass. Just listen to these words from a theologian called Gordon Fee. He was professor of systematics at Gordon-Conwell in Massachusetts, and now he's uh, in Regents College in in Vancouver. This is what he says about Titus 3.3. This is not a pretty picture, he says, but as always, such lists unerringly diagnose the human condition. You would have been hard-pressed 60 years ago to find a commentary that would have said that. In those days, people thought that Paul was exaggerating when he wrote these New Testament epistles. But not today. People recognize the truth of it today. People are at last beginning to discover that these things are deeply embedded in us and that they are very difficult, if not impossible, to eradicate. And that's what the Bible tells us. They are impossible for us to eradicate, apart from the grace and the power of God being at work in our lives. So look at the list. Firstly, he says, we ourselves were also once foolish. That's the description. We Christians were once unbelievers, and we were foolish. Now, when Paul says that, what he's actually doing is using technical language. He's not saying that unbelievers are dunces, that they're all simpletons. What he's saying is this applies to clever people, to all people. The the chairman of Mensa in the UK might very well, from Paul's point of view, be a fool if he or she is not a Christian. In Bible terminology, a fool is someone who says there is no God or whose whole outlook on life and the way in which they live their life, it's all on the basis that they don't need to take God seriously. And when you see that, you realize that most people in our country today are fools. Just turn back to that passage we read earlier in Ephesians 4 for a diagnosis of a fool. In verse 17, he says, This I say and testify in the Lord that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their minds. Their minds are futile. Having their understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the blindness of their heart. Now in verse 19 he goes on to speak about the callousness, the hardness of heart, the licentiousness and the greediness of Men, But verse 19 is really a description of the results of the ignorance that he speaks of in verse 18. That they have their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance 
that is in them and because of the blindness of their hearts. Those results are seen in our society today, aren't they? They're reappearing all through our land. People past feeling. In other words, hard-hearted. Well, you read about that in the newspapers every day, don't you? And you see it on the news broadcasts, on the television. The kind of hard-heartedness that was witnessed in Pontypridd in these past few days when a man murdered and dismembered a woman in his home. You see it with ISIS, beheading people, slaughtering people like animals. Hard-heartedness. Greediness. Well, we know a lot about that, don't we? We're living with the results and the effects of greed for these past five or six years. It has devastated the economy worldwide, globally. Lewdness. You might not have read about that in your newspapers, but you see it every day, everywhere, all around you. You see these marks of greed and filth, the hardness of heart that snuffs out another person's life without even flinching. That is so characteristic of our own 21st century. And what Paul tells us here is that it comes from a futile mind. It comes from a darkened understanding, from an ignorant heart. In other words, foolishness. From a lack of the knowledge of God. From a lack of spiritual sensibility. A lack of any kind of realization that there is a creator to whom we are each answerable. A materialistic philosophy of life, however brilliant, in the eyes of the New Testament, is folly, foolishness. So when Paul comes to his list here in Titus 3, Paul says, This is the first mark of when we were pagans. Before we were Christians, we we were foolish. And then he says that we were disobedient. Now that... I think has something to do with what he's saying in verse 1 where he calls upon Christians to be obedient to those who are in authority. One mark of the pagan is that he is in a permanent state of ferment and revolutionary idealism just as many people are today. It's something that we are born with as fallen human beings. We are unwilling to submit. We just don't want to come under any kind of authority. You see it in young children. Most little children have an iron will, a self-centeredness that wants his own way. And you see little children trying to shrug off their, their parents' authority. I see it in myself. I see it in you too. We are born with a struggling spirit that refuses point blank to accept the subordinate position in society, in the family, in any situation, and in any institution, an unwillingness to fit in with other people, and an ever-ready disobedience. It's part of the fallen human condition. Look at the next description. Deceived. Now, that's a passive word. It means led astray, duped, duped. And obviously, the ancient world was duped. In many ways, politically and religiously, it was open very much to the charlatans of the day. And the same is true in our generation. We are possibly better educated than people in the first century, though that's something of an assumption, I suppose. But isn't it so that we are just as easily led astray by clever propaganda, by fast talking, by popular slogans, Isn't it true that many of the young people of our day at university, where they're supposed to be at the fount of knowledge, are simply following the crowd? They're not really thinking for themselves. All over the world, there are religions with multitudes of people being duped by false messiahs. We've got plenty of those in 21st century evangelicalism as well. Think back to Germany in the 1930s, duped by Hitler. Russia, duped by Stalin. Great Britain, duped by the claims of politicians and economists that the market economy is the answer to all our problems. Or then later, education, education, education. That's the answer to all our problems. The mark of a society that turns away from the truth of God is that it swallows the lies of men. And we're deceived. Look at the next phrase. 
serving various lusts and pleasures, serving as a slave the various lusts and pleasures. It's, it's an interesting phrase. The word pleasure, pleasure there is the only occasion it's used in the New Testament, and it is describing ordinary pleasures of life, everyday things that we enjoy. I don't think Paul was against pleasure. Dylan Thomas, in one of his short stories, A Holiday Holiday Memory, speaks of a cross man on an orange box shouting that holidays were wrong. I don't think the Apostle Paul would preach against bank holiday weekends, that he was against us enjoying ourselves. I don't think he would decry a day at the seaside for us. Now, what he's talking about here is that condition we can come into when material happiness so takes over our lives that it becomes the master, a tyrant over us, so that we can't think of anything else. And self-indulgence rules us, rules the day. Don't you see that today? Isn't that a little bit close to the bone? Perhaps a little bit too close to comfort? Certainly that was true in first century Hellenistic Roman society. And I think we are seeing it today all around us and perhaps in us. A lack of restraint when it comes to our desires and to our pleasures. We want when what we want and we'll have it when we want it, and we are going to enjoy it to the full. The next phrase, living in malice and envy. Well, that's strong language, isn't it? And you might think that's a little bit over the top. Is it really true? We might ask that that's how people live. And of course it is. It's true of most institutions. Have you never sat on a committee and seen this? What is it that so often makes it so difficult, if not impossible, for a committee to work together? Well, it's malice and envy. Why is it that there are all kinds of stresses and strains between people in the place where you work? It's malice and envy. These things are very deep-seated weeds in the soil of our hearts. We see it sometimes, sadly, in the church. So we ought not to be surprised that we see it in the world. Malice and envy. And the next phrase, hateful and hating one another. Well, Paul, how can you say that? That's going too far now, surely. Well, I think at that point Paul is looking at a society very much at the point of disintegration. And when a society is approaching disintegration, what is it that happens in every sphere? Social, political, political religious, well, what is it that comes before serious disagreement? It's hatred, hating one another. That's what marked society in Rwanda back some decades ago. Hatred, bile being poured over the media every day towards the Hutus. Until in the end, the most appalling genocide took place. Well, that's Paul's brief description of human nature in verse 3. He might have written that himself. Uh, On the other hand, he might have borrowed it from an early church catechism. We, We don't really know, and it doesn't really matter. But he's describing what pagan life is before we come to God. Now, if those things are so human, uh, so Uh, deeply rooted in the human condition, how can they ever be removed? Well, we might try a number of things. For many years, and still for some uh, today, they still say, well, the answer is education. Raise the standard of education, and gradually mankind will rise above these base things. What we actually find is that we create a more articulate and ingenious sinner. Some have espoused example. An example is a powerful thing. Example in the family, example in school and in society in general. Others say, well, it's exhortation. You appeal to the best in people. You appeal to the best, and we all need to be exhorted for the best. 
to be brought out for the good of society. But if you look at what Paul says in verse 3, and if we examine that soberly, if verse 3 is true, if it's anywhere near the truth, then we see that education and example and exhortation, that trinity of human endeavour, is never, never going to rid mankind of the evil that is so intrinsic and so entrenched in our nature. What we need is the Holy Trinity of verse 4 and 5. We need God, our Saviour, to be kind to us, and the power of the Holy Spirit to renew us, and the saving power of Jesus Christ to be at work in us. Every generation has attempted and failed to regenerate human society. We need something much more radical than anything that we can produce ourselves. We need a divine intervention. We need this regeneration of which the Bible speaks, which is not human at all, but divine. It comes from above, the Lord Jesus told Nicodemus. Nicodemus, Jesus said, you have got to be born again. You have got to be regenerated. And Nicodemus didn't know what Jesus was talking about, even though he was a religious leader in his day. But what Jesus told him was that he needed to be born above, not from below. Human capacity, human power is never going to be enough to renew a human soul, let alone to renew a society. There's got to be regeneration from above. Because by nature we do not reverence God as our creator. We don't worship him. We don't respect God as the lawgiver. We hate God's will. We don't rejoice in God as the giver. We are ungrateful, and that is sin. We don't recognize God as our judge, but we are defiant of him. And we don't receive God as Savior. We refuse him and his Christ. So it's quite evident that we can't save ourselves. When we realize that, well, when we realize that, we do the only thing that God calls us to do, which is to cry out to him for mercy. The answer to our terrible, terrible condition, which is that we are sinners, and our terrible plight, which is that we are helpless, is God's amazing grace that regenerates us and gives us new life and a new start. So we must look to Jesus Christ, and we mustn't be looking at ourselves and glancing at ourselves, but all the merit is his, and we must be looking to God to give us the Holy Spirit and fix our attention upon God's Word. It's the Word of God that the Holy Spirit uses. It speaks to us of our, of our great need, this enormous need that we have, because sin has got us in its grasp, and it's destroying us. And it says... The Scripture speaks to us and holds before us this glorious Saviour who alone can give us a new start uh, that is new and eternal, that we can come to him and put our trust in him. That's the experience of regeneration. It's something that we can't bring about for ourselves. We must go to God for it because we are helpless in the hands of God. And my prayer then is that if this experience is not yours already, that you'll begin to seek it today this very evening, to seek it, to come to God's word and call upon God, your Savior, to give you this joyful experience of regeneration and renewal in the Holy Spirit. And then you'll really know, then you'll really understand. Let's pray. We ourselves were once foolish and disobedient, deceived. But when the kindness and love of God our Saviour appeared, he saved us. Our gracious God, we pray that you write these words upon our hearts and minds tonight. We thank you that they're given to us, not that we might feel right, but that we might be right and live right. We thank you for the gift of regeneration. We thank you for the possibility of hope. And we ask that by lip and life we may commend the gospel to our friends, to our neighbours, for Jesus' sake. Amen.